really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast with Karen Wyatt. I'm here sharing with you my inspirations and ideas for how to live a better life, how to grow to our full potential as spiritual beings here on earth, and not just theoretically, but the nitty gritty of what it takes to actually grow spiritually in the world we're living in right now. So today I'm sharing with you an episode that was recorded a couple of years ago for my other podcast, but it's very relevant to what's happening today. And this is the first of a four-part series. It's called The Dance of Life and Death. And this first episode is on timing. So this is something really interesting for us right now because we're we're at a place we are coming out of we hope a pandemic that has lasted for for a year and a half now and timing is rather important for all of us and it's not in our control it's something we actually have to let go of and we have to trust so that's what i'm working on right now in my own life is trusting that the timing of things will be okay, even though I cannot imagine how they're going to work out. So I hope you find some inspiration in this episode as you listen in on my thoughts about timing as part of the dance of life and death. This is going to be a new series titled The Dance of Life and Death. And this actually comes from a little section in the book, What Really Matters, where I perceived life and death as partners in a dance. And here's a little quote from the book. Life and death, two partners holding one another closely, swaying eternally to the music of the universe. And so this four-part series is going to be talking about my vision of a dance taking place eternally between life and death. And very interestingly to me, I have recently been reading a little book called The Dark Interval, Letters on Loss, Grief, and Transformation. With These are letters that were written by Rainer Maria Rilke and translated and edited by Ulrich Baer. And Ulrich said, uh, sent me a copy of this book, uh, thinking I would be interested in it because I'm a big fan of the writings of Rilke, both his letters to a young poet and some of his other poetry I've really enjoyed reading. So Ulrich was gracious enough to send me this book. It's very fascinating because the book contains about two dozen letters that Rilke wrote to friends and ex-lovers when they were grieving over some sort of a loss. So these were letters of condolence. And Ulrich compiled these particular letters out of about 15,000 letters that Rilke wrote during his lifetime because he was a, a prolific letter writer. And And um, Ulrich Baer compiled these letters and translated them from their original German into English. And uh, it is indeed a beautiful collection of Rilke's thoughts and spiritual explorations around death and grief. So I've been reading these letters and recognized how similarly Rilke sees life and death as at least my perception has been. And I I wanted to share with you just a few quotes from some of these letters because Rilke is such a beautiful writer and Ulrich Baer did such a fantastic job translating the letters as well. So the very first letter begins, there is death in life and it astonishes me that we pretend to ignore this death whose unforgiving presence we experience with each change we survive because we must learn to die slowly we must learn to die that is all of life and then uh, another additional passage All of our true relationships, all of our enduring experiences touch upon and pass through everything, through life and death. We must live in both 
be intimately at home in both. And he goes on to say that death is like the dark side of the moon turned away from us. So its existence is easy to deny. And he says, when you are thrust into a time of loss and grief, that's when you lose your denial of death. And when for the first time you can become whole, he describes over and over in these letters that we really are not whole beings until we encounter and acknowledge death and begin to carry it with us as part of our lives. And I love that sentiment. It fits so perfectly with everything that I've experienced in my life and everything that I believe. And so further on in the book, Rilke describes a Greek poem, and I'm not familiar with this poem, but he says that in this poem, two lovers exchange clothing And in their embrace, they become confused and confounded, meaning they can no longer tell who is who or which is which as they embrace one another. And that is what brought back my thoughts about the dance of life and death. Life and death are these two lovers embracing one another. And in that embrace, we lose the ability to tell them apart. Life becomes death and death becomes life as they are intertwined and dancing throughout eternity. So that was just such a beautiful image in my mind. And I decided that I wanted to share that with all of you and talk a little bit more about this idea of life and death, two partners dancing together and why they're equally important in life. And to carry on the metaphor of death, During these four parts of this series, I'm going to talk about four elements of life that pertain to dance. And today I'm going to talk about timing specifically. So if you imagine a couple, I always think of a couple doing a sensual tango together and how perfect their timing has to be. Their steps have to be perfectly matched and the timing has to be together for every lunge and every twirl on the dance floor. And I think that timing is such an important element of our lives, but one that actually frustrates us quite a lot and that we don't really understand. We live by the clock and time really dictates much of our activity. And if you think about some of the idioms that we have, we're killing time, we're making time, we're passing time. We're trying to buy time. Many idioms that we have describe this sense of frustration around the fact that time is not cooperating with us. Time isn't really doing what we wish it would do. We either need more of it or less of it, or we're trying to force it to be something that it's not. And so as we talk about this idea of timing as it relates to life and death, I have some stories to tell you. These are stories from my life that are all intertwined together. I hope you'll find it interesting, hopefully inspiring as well. And I just want to share with you this idea of timing and why we have to let go of our attempts to control timing and learn to trust the natural timing of both life and death. So this story begins way, way back in time, back when I was 12 years old. And I first recognized that I was here to become a doctor. It became really clear to me that that's what I wanted to do, but also that that was my calling. It was something very deep, a a huge part of me and of who I felt I was and why I felt I was here at all during this lifetime. I needed to become a doctor. So at the age of 12, I began to dedicate myself to the idea of becoming a doctor. I read all about it in our world book encyclopedia that we had at home. I I read about what it took to become a doctor. I learned about medical school then. I saw lots and lots of pictures in the encyclopedia of doctors, all of whom were men, all of whom were white men wearing white coats and looking very studious and very serious. And the only doctors I had ever seen in my life had all been 
men, white men, older men. I'd never seen a woman doctor before, but somehow I still understood I had this vision that I needed to be a doctor. And I actually saw that I would not be the same doctor as these pictures that I saw in the encyclopedia or the doctors that I had visited during during my lifetime up to that point, that I was somehow going to be a different kind of doctor. But I knew that that's what was where I was headed. So after reading about medical school and what it took to get into medical school at that young age, I, I became extremely goal oriented and I devoted myself to studying all the sciences that I could possibly take in school. So in high school, I also took four years of Latin. And then in college, I double majored in biology and chemistry. I took every science and math class I could possibly take, leaving very, very little time for literature, for art, things that I actually also really loved. But I was devoted to the sciences because I felt that's what would help me get into medical school. So I was a straight A student. Uh, I always did really well. I graduated in the top 10 of my college class. And I did not get accepted to medical school the first year that I applied uh, during my senior year in college. And so after all of these years of working to become a doctor and doing everything perfectly, and in fact, throughout high school and college, I never went to a party. I literally never had a weekend off. I was constantly studying uh, to prepare myself to be a doctor. And then I did not get accepted into medical school. And I was absolutely devastated and crushed. Having devoted everything I had, all of my energy, all of my attention, all of my time to this prospect, this goal of trying to become a doctor, I, I, I was totally wiped out when I finally got that last letter of rejection. And uh, it was humiliating. As I said, I was one of the top 10 students of my class. And they had a special dinner for us at the end of the year at around the time of graduation, honoring all 10 of us at the top of our class. And each one of us had to get up and say what we were doing next. And of those 10 people, I was the only one who had no plan I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't get accepted to medical school. So um, my classmates who were also graduating with honors were, they were going to Harvard Law School. They were going to other medical schools. Some were going to Oxford. Some were going on to master's degree programs and already committed, already knew where they were going and what they would be doing for the next few years. And I had no idea. So I had to stand up and say that and say, I don't know where I'm going next. It was horrible. <laughs> I was completely devastated and ashamed of myself. And I felt like a total failure and also like a fool because I had given up so many years of my young life already to this goal of becoming a doctor. And the door just got slammed in my face. At that time, I had grown up in the Lutheran church, a Christian faith, and I really had a simplistic belief that if you do the right thing, you will be rewarded. God will reward you for doing the right thing. And I totally believed I had done nothing but the right thing all of those years, preparing myself to go to medical school so I could be a doctor, so I could help people. And yet God betrayed me and abandoned me and let me down and I didn't get in. And so I really struggled. I was devastated and depressed. I ended up going to graduate school for one year. I got involved in a one-year research program. So I started working in a laboratory, helping with research. I took a few classes and I got a job as a bartender because I had to pay my way. I had to figure out how I was going to survive. And I literally thought, okay, maybe I'm just meant to be a bartender for the rest of my life. And that's what I will do. And again, I was depressed and I was completely lost trying to figure out 
where to go next and what to do. And my professor who was leading the research team that I was on took me aside and he said, you need to apply to medical school again. He said, you have no idea how often this happens. A lot of people don't get in the first year they apply. So he insisted that I apply again the next year, though I really hardly had enough energy to muster to do that again, to fill out all of the application forms and send them out. But the second year that I applied, I got accepted to three medical schools. So I actually got to choose which school I went to, which was interesting and amazing, yet I was still angry and I still felt betrayed that I hadn't gotten in the first year, which felt to me like the right thing that should have happened. That should have been the way the timing worked out. And I still felt humiliated and ashamed, even going to medical school and being a year older than some of the other students in my class. I felt embarrassed to tell them I didn't get in when I applied the first year. So I was carrying around a huge burden on my shoulders. But the year after medical school started and I was safely, safely enrolled in taking all my medical school courses, my mom came to visit me and she brought me a gift, which was a clock that she and my grandfather, her dad, who was a carpenter, had made for me. It was, the clock had a wooden frame, had the normal clock parts in the back and a face that had been placed on top of the wood that my grandpa had put together. And then my mom had painted on the front of it, God's timing is perfect. She gave me this gift and she was so excited and so proud. And she said, now that you're in medical school, I know that you hated having to take a year off. But she said, I just wanted to remind you that God's timing is perfect. It's not the same as our timing and it's perfect. And she was so happy and delighted with her gift. And I was furious because I was still really mad. I was mad that I hadn't been able to control the outcome and control the timing. And I was still carrying the burden, feeling betrayed by God, feeling foolish uh, within myself of how much time and effort I had put into trying to get into medical school and not believing that things had worked out perfectly at all. I was still bitter. So I didn't particularly like that clock. I didn't like what it said. And I didn't like having it hang on the wall as a constant reminder of this issue of timing that I did not agree with at that point. So I left it hanging in my the little house where I was living for a while so my mom would see it when she came to visit. But when I moved the next time, which I moved frequently at that time, um, I stuck it into a box. And this was a box in my closet of craft projects that I had worked on in the past but never finished. I put the clock inside that box. There were skeins of yarn. There were uh, needlepoint canvases, if that's what you call them. I don't even remember now. And in that box, there was a half-finished quilt that I had been uh, working on for several years This quilt I had been making for my best friend from high school, Kathy, who had gotten married a few years earlier, and I was her maid of honor, and I had decided to make her a quilt as a gift for her wedding. I'd never done anything like that before, had no, I knew nothing about quilting. I just was arrogant enough to think, oh, I could make her a quilt in my spare time. And I chose a pattern that was very intricate with very small triangles and squares that had to be fit together. And I decided to sew it by hand because I thought that would be even more meaningful if I made the entire quilt by hand. So I had already spent a lot of hours working on that quilt for Kathy. Kathy. And when her wedding arrived, again, it was at that time, it was less than half finished. And I told her about it, embarrassed, I felt sad, I didn't get it finished. I had no idea how hard it would be or how much work it would take to make an entire quilt by myself, by hand, hand sewing every stitch of the quilt. But we joked that I would give her the quilt someday, it was going to get to her someday down the road, and maybe it would be for her anniversary or something. Well, Kathy's marriage 
didn't even last a year. She and her husband had their marriage annulled nine months later. And so I had continued to work on the quilt. I'd made more progress on it, but suddenly it felt moot. Like, why am I making this as a wedding present for the marriage that didn't last? It's over with now. What do I do with this quilt? So I had kind of given up on it and I put it in this box along with all my other half done projects, scarves I'd been knitting, as I said, needle points, I'd been trying to make a needle point picture I wanted to give to my mom, never finished any of them. So the clock went in that box because it would be safe in there. There was lots of fabric and yarn, soft things to pad it. I stuck it underneath the quilt um, where it would be protected, but I left it in that big box. As time went on, Again, I was in medical school at this time and then getting ready to move on to residency. So I moved a few times and that big box of unfinished projects, which which I now think of as my box of unfinished business, went with me on every move, but I never opened it. I never again looked at any of those projects in that box. I didn't have time. I was in a new phase of my life and I just, I'd lost interest in working on any of them. So I had taken that big box with me unopened through two or three moves and I remembered hearing someone say, if, if, you, if you are moving a lot and you have a box that you never open, isn't that proof that you don't need whatever is inside that box? And so on my next move, which was to move in with my husband as we were getting married at the end of residency, I took that box to, to goodwill and gave it away unopened and decided whatever is in it, I don't need it. I haven't opened the box for all these years. I don't need it. So I gave that box away. And I didn't mind. I felt okay about it. I felt okay about getting rid of that and unloading it so I wouldn't have to keep carrying it with me. But a few months later, my grandfather died. And I went home for his funeral. And my mom was saying to me, I'm so glad that you have that clock that grandpa made because that was the very last thing he ever made. And my grandpa was a carpenter, so he had this amazing wood shop. His whole garage was turned into a woodworking shop with all of these tools. And I remember piles of sawdust and stacks of boards and uh, just watching him work out in his shop. And my mom described to me how she had asked him if he could make this clock, and he hadn't even been in his wood shop for many years at that point. Uh, he was in his 80s at that time, but he really wanted to make the clock for me. So he went in the wood shop and she helped him pick out the wood. And she actually went there to, to sit there with him while he worked on it. And she said his hands were very shaky. He had a hard time seeing, but it meant so much to him to make that clock. And he put in so much effort putting the boards together just such a way, like cutting them, um, carving them around the edges so that it would look beautiful with the face of this clock on it. And then my mom had gotten help from a friend of hers who is an artist to put the writing on the front of the clock that said, God's timing is perfect. She and my grandpa had worked on that clock for at least a month or so before she brought it to me. No wonder she was so excited and proud and happy to give me that clock. And in that moment, I was completely blown apart because I saw myself so clearly. I saw my pettiness, my shallowness, my immaturity. I saw how that I had been so bitter and felt so betrayed and felt so sorry for myself that I could not in the moment perceive or appreciate this incredible gift that I had been given by my grandpa and my mother. And my grandfather was no longer here. And I didn't get to see him in the year before he died. I didn't get to even say goodbye to him. And so again, I, I went through a terrible devastation as I saw 
you know what? I'm kind of a bad person. I can't believe that I was so rejecting of this clock. And it was because of my bitterness and it was because of my refusal to accept the idea that I didn't get into medical school the first year I applied. That's so shallow and selfish and so immature. And I didn't tell my mom that I wasn't sure at that point where the clock was. I couldn't quite remember where I had put it. And I ran down in the basement. We still had a few things in the basement of our house that hadn't been fully unpacked. I tore through those boxes when I got home and the clock wasn't there. And I sat down and realized and remembered, actually, it was in the box of unfinished projects, the box of unfinished business that I thought I could just give that away. I could just give it away and get rid of all the feelings of failure and incompleteness and the feelings of grief and the feelings of bitterness that were attached to those items that were in the box, including the quilt I had made for Kathy. I thought I could just get rid of all of that. But the truth is, The unfinished business in that box followed me. (laughs) I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't lose it from my life. And the first thing I did was drive to Goodwill (laughs) because I thought, okay, the clock, I gave the clock to Goodwill. What if they're selling it? What if it's there? What if I can find it? And I literally went to Goodwill like every day for a while. And then I started going once a month after that. And even I will tell you there are even days now when I, I go to a yard sale or a thrift shop and the idea occurs to me, what if I found the clock here? What if the clock was here? And I wish that I could tell you that I did find the clock one day, but I have not. I have lived all these years without the clock my grandpa made for me by hand and my mom painted for me by hand, uh, which I selfishly and foolishly gave away. So I have carried that burden of my actions of giving that clock away for a long time. And the day that my mom talked to me about the clock and how special it was, that's the day I also woke up and realized the perfection of the timing of my entrance into medical school for the first time. Because, as I said, I had worked so hard through high school and college, never really even took a day off. I was constantly studying, constantly learning in order to be prepared for medical school. During the year off that I had um, against my will that I didn't want to have, that year I worked as a bartender. I met some fascinating people. I learned a ton about life. I learned how to negotiate, really, um, my own life and paying bills and uh, making money and working for someone else. And I got some crushes on guys that I dated that year. Uh, I drank alcohol for the first time ever and learned about that world. Uh, Went to a few parties. It completely opened me up to some things that I had denied myself during all my years of trying to prepare for medical school. And I realized that was probably really important education that I needed to have at that time in my life. So that one year, I was still being prepared for medical school. I was still learning things. I needed to know. I just didn't realize it. Also, when I got to medical school, I entered into the most amazing and unique class of students I could ever describe to you. I made so many wonderful best friends in that class. And we had really an incredible time in medical school for as stressful as that training is. Um, We had super talented people in our class and creative people, a lot of musicians. We formed our own little band and we wrote parody songs and we wrote skits. We had so many people with acting talent, comedians, um, dancing, tap dancing. We had people with all kinds of interesting skills and we all got together and started 
started performing skits uh, at pretty much every quarter of the year for our classmates and then eventually the entire medical school and eventually m- most of the staff of the hospital next door started attending our performances because they were so much fun and so amazing. And so had I gotten into medical school one year earlier, chances are it would have been a different medical school and it would have been a different class with different people. By getting in one year later, I got a chance to be part of that class with those people with whom I connected so well. And uh, many of us are still friends today and, and still in touch with each other. So that was absolutely perfect timing. I got into the right class at the right time with the right classmates. But the next thing that happened after medical school, I went to residency training and In my residency training is where I met my husband, who was in the same class as me, a year younger than me. Um, And I would have not probably not met him and probably not met at that same training program had I gotten in a year earlier. So because I was, let's say, held back a year, I was in the right place once again to meet my husband, the man that I've spent my whole adult life with. And we just celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary. So those incredible blessings may not have happened without that perfect timing of me not getting into medical school. And all these years later, I've been able to look back and kind of laugh at um, how short-sighted I was at the time and how devastated I was by not being able to see that there's something bigger than just the way I think things should work out. There's something more important than that going on here. So I learned a lot early in my life about timing and accepting timing and the way things work and that often the timing of things in our lives, it's not what we hoped for and particularly the timing of death. Because I'll tell you something else. Shortly after I grieved over missing the clock that I had given away, my friend Kathy died. And so not only did I never finish the quilt in time for her marriage, I never finished the quilt for the rest of her life. So she died of an overdose. And so the timing of her death felt absolutely horrible to me. I couldn't even believe that it happened. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that she was gone. And I was plunged once again into such grief and guilt. Again, I hadn't seen her for the previous year. She'd been struggling a lot with mental health issues. I hadn't been able to visit her. And once again, I I remembered the quilt. I never finished the quilt. I gave it away. (laughs) I took it on. I couldn't do it. It was bigger than me. And I let her down. I didn't visit her. I felt horrific guilt from not being the friend that I had wanted to be for Kathy and wondering and questioning, would she still be here if I had been able to get more involved in her life and if I had been there for her more? So here was another death with, again, uh, there's no good timing for anyone's death, but another death that I had to carry with me and cope with as part of the fabric of of who I am. And, And I had to cope with the guilt I felt from not being where I wished I had been. Um, the guilt of not having made time for Kathy, not having made time for my grandfather and, then having them die before I even recognized that I wish that I should have or would have or wanted to make time for them. So again, death was thrust into my path. And this was all just three or four years before my father's death would occur. And so already I was looking at death and looking at grief and wondering about it and dealing with it before my father even died. And as I read the letters from 
Rilke that he sent to his friends who were grieving, I was really touched with how he he talked about the idea that we are not really whole in our lives until we have accepted death. That if we insist only on looking at life and what life offers us and try to ignore death and what death offers us, then we are not whole in our being. We are not whole people and we're not living wholly the way we should. And Rilke went on to say, in many ways, those of us who have early experiences with death are fortunate because we're given the opportunity to get acquainted with death, to see the other side of the moon, to recognize the partner of life in this dance that is taking place. Through our pain and our sorrow and our grief, we are able to become our whole selves and whole people finally because we can bring death back into life. We can unite the love life and death and allow them to dance through our own lives. And being reminded of this by Rilke's letters showed me just how much I was being prepared for my dad's death through the guilt and the pain that I felt over my grandfather's death and my friend Kathy's death before dad ever died, which was um, the huge blow of grief and guilt that totally changed my life. But I saw how death was preparing me in its own way and teaching me at each step along the way. And I'll repeat that quote that I read at the very beginning from Rilke, there is death in life, and it astonishes me that we pretend to ignore this death whose unforgiving presence we experience with each change we survive because we must learn to die slowly. We must learn to die. That is all of life. And so those experiences with the clock and giving away the clock and my grief and guilt over my grandpa's death and the unfinished quilt and the terrible timing of my friend Kathy's death Those were part of my learning process of learning to die slowly, spending my life learning about dying. My dad's death, which came three or four years later, was a huge lesson, huge. And I might not have survived it had I not been through the experiences of the other two deaths, had the timing been different of those events. So here we have these lives that we are living here on planet Earth, where we can actually dream and conceive of a future that we would like to see happen. We have that capacity to envision our future and to plan and set goals for how we would like to see that future unfold, what timing we would like to see take place for the events of life that we're hoping to arrive at. And yet we exist in this plane where timing isn't really under our control. We really don't determine how and when things happen to us. We can make as many plans as we like, and yet those plans are all really up in the air and can randomly be interrupted or canceled at any time. And I see learning how to deal with these timing issues of life is also part of our preparation for death. We're learning how to let go of our expectations that things should turn out a certain way, that because I did this, this should happen. We're learning to let go of those expectations of cause and effect. And all of that is in preparation for how death might show up in our lives and when it might show up because none of us knows the answer to that question. None of us has any idea how and when our own death will come. And as Rilke says, we're preparing for it. We're learning as we go and every change we go through in life is part of that learning experience. And this change and the timing of change is something that probably most of us struggle with 
for all of our lives. Um, I find myself constantly falling into the trap of thinking that I could control the timing of things. I was remembering when my mother died um, just six years ago. And even though she had been ready to die for five years and telling me constantly she was ready to go, she had asked God to take her at any time. She'd done all of her work and all of her preparation. She was totally ready, and therefore I had time to be ready for her to die as well because we'd talked about it over and over again for five years. And I came to take care of her And it turned out to only be the very last week of her life that I stayed with her and cared for her um, because death came very quickly. I came to stay with her thinking she would live for six weeks, two months or so. I was prepared to stay with her for that amount of time. And yet she was gone by the end of that week. She was so ready to die and so prepared for it that her last days were not much of a struggle for her. It was a fairly easy process for her to let go of life. But I was the one who wasn't ready. I was the one who was struggling in spite of the fact that I'd been well prepared. I knew that this was coming and I knew that I would be there with her this time. I was not going to miss the chance to be at her bedside since there had been so many other deaths in my life that I had not been present for. So two nights before she died, um, mom and I had an amazing, incredible experience of total forgiveness for one another in the middle of the night. It involved her trying to climb out of bed and me clumsily trying to figure out how to get her back into bed. Um, And it was actually uh, funny when I looked back at it in the end, but it resulted in the two of us holding each other and having this amazing total recognition of one another and total forgiveness of one another. It's hard for me to even describe it because it was so profound, and yet it happened in such a simple way. But both of us, it's as if we each completely tore down barriers that had existed between us as long as I could remember since early childhood. We tore those barriers down. There was complete forgiveness of one another, complete understanding, and we were connected in love with one another that was so powerful and so amazing. I I can't even find the words to really describe it. It was the most beautiful experience. And in my heart, I remember, I remember saying to myself, this is the love from my mom that I've been waiting for my entire life. Here it is. She loves me. I love her. And it's pure and it's clear. And there are no strings attached and there are no agendas and there are no hidden resentments. There's nothing. It's pure love. And at last, I found what I had been searching for with my mom for my whole life in that moment. And the very next morning, I woke up and mom was already in a state of agonal breathing. Um, She lived for another 24 hours, but I already knew that morning that this was the very end. This was going to be her last day of life. And yet we just found each other. We just found each other a few hours before. This was horrible timing. I wanted more time. And I wept and wept because I thought I only just now found this love that that I waited for my whole life. And now she's going to die. She's leaving. And this is all I'm going to get. This is all there is. And I remembered feeling some of that same old bitterness and resentment of like, it's wrong. The timing is wrong. This shouldn't happen. This isn't right. I need her to stay longer. I want more time to share the love that we have for each other. And yet that time was not granted. The time wasn't there. So I did my weeping. I went through my day of sorrow. But at the moment of my mom's death, when I felt her, I literally felt her soul leaving her physical body. It was an amazing, tangible experience in that room. 
at that moment, I felt all of that love we had shared together intensify exponentially inside my heart at the moment that she died. And as much as I had been imagining for the 24 hours before that now I'm going to lose her and I'm going to lose this feeling of love that I only just now got, that wasn't true. That wasn't what happened. I gained a thousand times more love at the moment of her death that just filled me completely. And so I didn't see that coming either. It was another time when I didn't understand the the path we were on. I didn't understand the timing, the timing of life and death. I didn't see how the dance was playing out. So I went through my time of resentment and fear and sorrow and disappointment in a very short time only to once again be filled with even more love than I could have imagined possible and was shown so quickly, don't worry about the timing so much. It's not in your control because you don't know what you're doing with the timing. You don't know the best thing. You don't know what's the perfect outcome. And so once again, another huge reminder and yet a beautiful reminder to let go of worrying about timing. The timing's never going to feel right. The timing's always going to feel like something's off. I would have done this differently. I would have planned it differently. I wanted it to turn out differently than it did. But that's where we have to stop ourselves and acknowledge, okay, I feel disappointed, but that's because my imagination isn't big enough because I can't see all the possibilities that are out there. I can't see all the ways in which this timing that is happening right now before my eyes is actually the perfect thing. I can't tell life from death anymore. I can't recognize. I can't differentiate between the two partners. They're dancing together and it's beautiful. And I just need to enjoy it. I just need to take it in. I need to feel every step of that dance, every turn, every twirl, every moment, every note of the music that's playing during this dance of life and death. And I need to allow the timing of things to be whatever it is and understand that it really is perfect. It really is perfect. Even if I can't see it today or tomorrow, and even if as much as I'm talking right now, five minutes after I finish this recording, I'll probably be upset about the timing of something else. Even in that state, it's all perfect. Even the fact that I'm confused about the timing sometimes, even the fact that I object and protest and feel sorrowful and disappointed in the timing, that's also a perfect part of it. So even the clock the clock that I rejected, that I gave away, that my grandpa made with his own hands and my mom assisted him, that beautiful clock that was full of nothing but love, the clock that I turned down and turned away, even the timing of that, of my refusal of the clock was perfect in its own way because I needed that event so that I could see my own selfishness more clearly and I could feel the pain of it. It helped me grow. And you know what? That clock today, the image of that clock, that clock is firmly burned into my brain and my heart. That clock goes with me wherever I go. I see it every day. I see the wood my grandfather so gently carved and put together to make the clock. I see the lettering on it. I see the verse, God's timing is perfect. And I may not have the clock hanging on my wall, but it's hanging in my heart, and it will be with me every moment until I die. Not just the clock, but the love that is symbolized by that clock. And so even the mistakes that we've made that we might think are mistakes, the times when we haven't followed through, we didn't show up, we weren't there, we let go of something, we didn't notice it, we didn't care enough about it, even those events 
have been perfect in their own way and all part of the timing, all part of the learning process as we're learning slowly through each change, through each experience, how to die. And so I'll leave you with that story in your minds and a little thought, if any of you, if you're ever in a thrift store somewhere and you see a clock that says God's timing is perfect, it's made from wood, give me a holler. Just let me know if you see it somewhere. Until then, there's no clock on my wall. As I said, it's in my heart. So that concludes part one of the dance of life and death timing. I hope you'll join me for the next three episodes as this series on the dance of life and death continues. And until we're together the next time, remember we're here for love. That is what matters more than anything right now. And so face your fear, be ready for whatever happens next, and love each and every moment of this sometimes crazy life. Bye-bye. Thank you.